As I begin this recording, a brief reminder to everyone joining us online, please make sure that your audio and video are disabled at all times. Interactions via chat will not appear on the recording. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Dr. Barnes, you're welcome to take over. Greetings, everybody. It's a pleasure to, to be with you all, to those who are online, to those who are, are at Westfall. Uh, I'm really pleased to make this presentation today and I, I hope it's informative. So let me go ahead and uh, get this set up and begin. I, I trust that my sound is okay. And- Your sound and image are excellent, Dr. Barnes. Okay. Well, in that case, Let's talk about the, uh, whoops, let me go back here. Let's talk about the, uh, the Voyage of the Damned, which actually was the title of a movie made many, many years ago about this voyage. It truly was the Voyage of the Damned. It was the MS St. Louis. A little backdrop for just a quick second before we get into the uh, voyage itself. Uh, this takes place, this uh, voyage, in May, June of 1939. The backdrop clearly to this was Kristallnacht on November 9th and 10th. That's when some 7,500 Jewish shops were vandalized. Hundreds of Jewish synagogues were torched and burned. Literally, although officially only 91, later research tells us hundreds of deaths took place immediately or in the days following Kristallnacht. 30,000 Jewish men were shipped off to Dachau, Sachsenhausen, and uh, Buchenwald. And here's just a picture of where various events, the night of, uh, uh, the night of broken glass, uh, literally the night of crystal, but more commonly referred to as the night of broken glass. Uh, and to make matters even worse, uh, the Nazi government fined the Jewish community one billion Reichsmarks for damage that was incurred that night, although the damage was almost entirely inflicted by the SA, the street thugs of the Nazis. And um, that, that one billion Reichsmarks translated in 1938 dollars to 440 million U.S. dollars. So uh, with that, clearly the sense of urgency to get out of Germany for Jews who could afford to do so uh, became palpable and pressing. And more than 900 signed up for a voyage from uh, Hamburg uh, heading to Cuba. Uh, on the SS Saint, on the MS St. Louis. Okay, this is a postcard of the ship. If you look kind of carefully here, you'll see that ah, there's the Statue of Liberty, there's the skyline of New York City, and this is uh, a postcard uh, of the St. Louis in Saint in New York. Uh, the captain, Gustav Schroeder, was not a Nazi. Far, far from it. He was a very honorable and decent captain. He instructed the crew to treat the passengers, almost every single one of them Jewish, to treat the passengers with respect and with dignity. He covered a bust of Adolf Hitler in one of the ballrooms. He, uh, he encouraged people to, to go swimming in the swimming pool. Uh, he, he had kosher food served in the dining rooms. He was a very decent uh, captain, as you will see here. Uh, what Schroeder does on this trip is, is pretty remarkable. So um, here's the uh, path that the St. Louis took. It leaves Hamburg on 13 May, okay, and it follows this route down to Havana. And you'll notice, though, that it lands in Havana on the 27th of May, but by June the 6th, the voyage has gone north 
and has going by the coast of Florida, close to the lights of Miami. And then it turns around as though it's heading back to Cuba, but instead heads back to continental Europe. However, Schroeder does not take it all the way back to Hamburg. Schroeder lands it in Antwerp in Belgium. So what was going on on this voyage? Uh, why the turnaround and return uh, to the continent? They set sail at eight o'clock on Saturday, May the 13th, 8 p.m. There were a total of 937 passengers, not every single one, but almost all of them were German Jewish refugees. There, was 200, there were 231 crew members, and as I said, they were bound for Cuba, and they got to Havana. The ship had eight decks. It was a pretty nice ship, uh, and yet accommodations came in only two different classes, uh, cabin class, which we would equate to uh, first class, and then third class. So you had something of a social pecking order here uh, between the people who were pretty well off and the people who were very well off. Uh, Schroeder made this entry in his diary. There is somewhat nervous disposition among the passengers. Despite this, everyone sees, seems convinced they will never see Germany again. Now I have some pictures to show you of what the accommodations were like on the MS St. Louis. This is a standard uh, upper deck stateroom, cabin class, okay? And these pictures are taken from the St. Louis. This is not some other ship. Um, so that's what a cabin upper deck stateroom looked like. Uh, they had smoking rooms, okay? And this was the cabin class smoking room, rather nicely appointed. Uh, looks like comfortable chairs, uh, an occasional lamp, um, ashtrays. Um, this was the cabin class dining room. Uh, linen, uh, nice silverware, uh, nice goblets, crystal glasses, uh, very comfortable, very dignified, uh, quite nice. Maybe just a step shy of elegant, but boy, this is 1939, looks pretty good. This is the ladies room, as it was called, for ladies in the cabin class. Uh, nicely appointed, comfortable chairs. Um, you could sneak away to here and join with your friends and talk. No men around, no children. Uh, this is a large cabin class hall, okay? It could be used for a number of different purposes. Uh, here it looks like it's set up uh, for some entertaining, uh, maybe a party, okay? Nice. Now we go to third class accommodations. A little more pedestrian. Uh, this is the social hall in third class. It's okay, but it doesn't have quite the opulence that the cabin class has, okay? Um, this is the dining room, again, appointed nicely, but, you know, a step, sh step shy of what it was like in cabin class. Uh, you, you begin to see the, the, the social differences between the rich and the not so rich uh, that exist in, in real life are being played out on this ship too. Uh, this is the smoking room for the third class. Uh, must say that these smoking rooms were almost exclusively males, uh, men. And again here, this is a, a little starker in cabin class. The accommodations, uh, this is what a third class cabin would look like. Accommodate two upper and lower bunks. And something I find kind of interesting, side-by-side -side sinks. So I guess you can uh, wash up and clean together. Uh, this is the bar, the third class, okay? 
Uh, not quite as nice as the, the social room for uh, the cabin class, but uh, it'll do. Now, on the, uh, the voyage itself, um, it, was, it was a delightful voyage, actually. Uh, there was only, well, there was one death. One elderly gentleman died uh, and was buried at sea. Um, however, for most of the passengers, and I'm going to show you some pictures in a second. Um, the voyage to Havana was one of excitement, anticipation, uh, a new life, uh, safe and away from the Nazis. There was much to be very happy about. And the, ad the atmosphere on the ship was, was somewhat festive. Here we see a couple on the St. Louis uh, chatting, perhaps having a drink. Uh, enjoying themselves. And it looks like a nice sunny afternoon too. Remember, this is early summer, okay? So the weather is by and large gonna be pretty decent. Uh, here's a picture of some of the passengers. Okay? And I wanna pause for a moment here and just give you the chance to look into the faces of these people. Here you see, you know, lots of, lots of children, boys, girls, Little infants, little infants, little children. Uh, many of the men are dressed in suits. This was a dress up affair. Uh, you went to dinner dressed up. Um, women in nice dresses, uh, men in suits and ties. A rather dignified uh, set of passengers, actually. And as you can tell by the smiles on their faces, this is a happy lot. They're, they're, they're having a good time. Now, here's two of the passengers doing what little boys do. Stick your tongue out at the person with the camera. Cute, huh? And here's a little girl, and we can presume that's her mom. Okay. Well, you know, these passengers are... Um, Looking forward to a new life in Havana, in Cuba. Now, many of them have hopes of getting from Havana to the United States. And while the, the, the appointments maybe weren't all that fancy in uh, the third class, uh, it doesn't seem to be daunting the spirits too much of, uh, of these passengers. Uh, they seem to be having a, a pretty good time, smiles pretty much all around. Dances were an evening affair uh, every night on the, uh, on the ship. Uh, there was uh, a dance and uh, uh, enjoyed by a large number of passengers. And uh, up top, uh, there was a swimming pool. And since this is early summer, uh, May and June, getting, we'll get into June, um, the passengers um, are enjoying a nice little swim. Okay, now we're going to pause for just a second here and slow down and get just a little bit technical and legalistic, okay? Start with the beginning here about Cuban law. It did not legally define the difference between a tourist and a refugee. Cuban law did not dictate what legally constituted a tourist and a refugee. However, as you can see next, it did specify that refugees needed visas and tourists did not, although the law itself didn't draw a distinction between a tourist and a refugee. Okay? Now, if this is not complicated enough, the director of immigration, a man named Manuel Benitez, sold the passengers so-called landing permits, which certainly looked like visas, and Benitez was pocketing a small fortune by charging each of these passengers $150 each. President, Cuban president, Federico Laredo Bru fired Benito, Benitez for his corruption, um, removed him from office. 
But then things get kind of muddy. In May, when the ship is at sea, the Cuban government passes Decree 937. It nullified landing permits. Those landing permits that Benitez had sold virtually every passenger. There, almost every passenger was carrying this landing permit. And now, while the ships at sea, these landing permits are nullified. Nonetheless, the ship arrives in Havana on May 27, but nobody's allowed off the St. Louis. Instead, immigration and Cuban police board the ship. They go through every passenger's, look at all, all their papers and all their documents, and they allow 28 people carrying valid US, US visas or entry documents to enter Cuba. Uh, now, the next day, an attorney named Lawrence Berenson, who was appointed by the US-based Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, so-called JDC, he arrives in Havana to negotiate for the passengers. In other words, the scene now is these folks are stuck on the boat. They can't get off. The Cuban government won't let them. President Brew concedes, Berenson meets with, with Brew, and Brew concedes that if the Joint Distribution Committee posts a $453,500 bond, okay, um, then he'll allow those passengers off and they can take refuge in Cuba. Now, that comes out to almost exactly $500 per passenger. Remember, they lost to the original 937, 28 of them were allowed off, okay? So what you've got here is now the JDC is going to have to raise about 900 times $500. And what that means is that, uh, oh, by the way, that $500 um, per passenger that translates to that 453 thousand dollar bond that five hundred dollars in 1939 uh, would translate today to nine thousand three hundred and three us dollars so you can see it was a, a very uh, hefty request that brew was making here and suffice to say the joint distribution committee simply can't raise the money um and so schroeder has no choice uh they get kicked out of the havana port and are told to leave. And he does so. He takes the ship on June the 2nd and they depart. Here's a picture of Cuban President Brew on the left and Lawrence Berenson, uh, the attorney who was representing the Joint Distribution Committee. He tried his honest hardest to uh, to negotiate with Brew, uh, but uh, it, it, it failed, it collapsed. Here's a picture of the St. Louis in the Havana Harbor. You can see there's various tugboats around the ship, okay? This ship, the, the, the St. Louis did fly the Nazi flag. Uh, that was a, a requirement, but Schroeder was not a Nazi, and this is going to be important in understanding the rest of this voyage. Here's a number of the passengers on the St. Louis waiting in the Havana Harbor, uncertain uh, between May 27th and June the 2nd, what's, uh, what's going to happen. Lots of rumors are occurring, lots of speculation but mostly a lot of fear and anxiety and, and immense worry, okay? Uh, telegrams are now being dispatched to Canadian government officials and certainly American government officials. Many are going directly to uh, President Roosevelt uh, requesting assistance, help, refuge, uh, an executive order, 
to allow the, um, the, the ship to land in, in Miami and the refugees to disembark there. When they are ordered to leave, it's a, it's a very disturbing result. As we see here, one woman reacting uh, to the order to leave. She's, I don't know if you'd say distraught, but I think we can sense the looks on these kids' face, look on this woman's face, a sort of, oh my God, what's gonna to happen to us now? Well, here's what Schroeder does. He takes this ship and he leaves Cuba and then says, okay, I'm gonna go up here by Miami, okay? But he doesn't stop in Miami. He's not allowed entry. Uh, port officials in the United States will not let the ship dock. Uh, and so he turns the ship around as though he's heading back to Cuba, but that didn't pan out in the beginning. It wasn't gonna work now either. And finally, the realization sets in that this ship is gonna to have to go back to Europe. Lots of telegrams were sent. Here's one that went to not the president, but to Mrs. Roosevelt in the White House. And it's from a lady named Lottie Frankel, who lives at 322 West 72nd Street in New York. Uh, Please help those unhappy people on the steamer St. Louis. They have to face death, compelled to go back to Germany. I have my parents on that boat. Please try to help immediately. He can really sense in this telegraph, you know, an amazing uh, sense of panic and fright and urgency. All the requests that went directly to President Roosevelt were never answered. And the U.S. denies entry. Okay. And this is how the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, the one in D.C., uh, this is how they describe the uh, ship. Sailing so close to Florida that they could see the lights of Miami, some passengers on the St. Louis cable, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, asking for refuge. Roosevelt never responded. The State Department and the White House had decided not to take extraordinary measures to permit the refugees to enter the United States. The State Department telegram sent to a passenger stated that the passengers must, quote, await their turns on the waiting list and qualify for and obtain immigration visas before they may be admissible into the United States. This is uh, that statement. And you see it's addressed to a woman in Miami, okay? is from the chief of the visa division in the State Department, okay? It's dated June 2nd, 1939, okay? Referring your telegram June 2nd, the immigration laws of the United States govern the entry of aliens into this country. The German refugees at Havana are understood to have registered in Europe as intending quota immigrants and must await their turns on the waiting list and then qualify for and obtain immigration visas before they may be admissible into the United States. So effectively, although couched in legalese, uh, the answer is no, we're not gonna let you in. Finally, on June the 6th, after being in U.S. waters, uh, Schroeder has no choice but to go back to Europe as slowly as he can. Uh, on June 7th, the next day, he informs the passengers they are headed back home. To, well, home being Europe. Okay? Schroeder is trying to weigh various options. He has 900 passengers on this ship and he knows 
as do they, what fate may well have in store for these Jews if they return to Germany. He really toys with one fairly serious uh, possibility, and that's running the ship ashore in Great Britain and then effectively forcing the Brits' hands and making them take uh, possession of the ship and possession of the passengers. While the passage back is underway, the Joint Distribution Committee continues negotiations with other countries. And finally, you get, they get four countries that agree to take passengers. Great Britain says they'll take in 228. Holland says 181 can come there. France agrees to take 224, and Belgium takes 214. Now, note very closely here, Holland, France, and Belgium are all on the continent of Europe, okay? Um, and uh, I've never been terribly sure whether Great Britain is part of Europe or not, but in any case, what we do know is that the English Channel makes a big difference <laughs> between where Great Britain is and where uh, these countries are located. So what he what Schroeder does is he lands the St. Louis in Antwerp on June the 17th, 1939, uh, where the passengers disembarked. Now a question remains to this very day. Why no executive order by FDR? That's clearly the most straightforward, simplest, easily done single stroke that would have saved uh, all of these lives um, and allowed them to be refuge, refugees in the United States. But well, you've got to understand that in the 1930s, America was not immune to this to a very similar kind of anti-Semitism that was sweeping and has swept Europe for centuries. Uh, you combine that with a fear of foreigners, xenophobia, uh, a large dose of what we would call simply nativism. Uh, uh, and then uh, isolationism, the idea that America did not want to get bogged down in another conflict in Europe, that they had just gone through that 20 years earlier. Uh, and it was kind of generally felt across the country that Europe was going to have to handle Europe's problems and the United States was going to stay out of it. But it's also, you also have to understand that there was a general hostility to immigrants more broadly. Uh, it wasn't just Jewish immigrants, it was immigrants of all kinds of stripes. On the West Coast, it was hostility to Chinese and Japanese immigrants. Okay? It had been hostility to Irish uh, and German non-Jewish immigrants uh, earlier. Uh, in earlier days in the United States. But Roosevelt was very acutely aware that isolationists had made gains in the 1938 congressional elections. And while he was contemplating an unprecedented uh, run for a third term in office, no president ever having done that, um, he was worried you know, about taking these refugees in what kind of message it would send and what kind of image uh, of himself uh, it would portray. He put all these things together and despite the pleas uh, by his wife, despite the pleas by so many other people, uh, both elected officials and like Lottie Frankel, the, 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 a child of, of immigrants on that ship, uh, he, Roosevelt, would not issue uh, an executive order. Uh, in fact, even uh, more hostily, he never even replied. So what ultimately happened? Well, everybody who was taken in by Great Britain survived the war, uh, except for one person who was killed in an air raid. Of the 620 who returned to the continent, 87 of them immigrated before the German invasion 
of France, Holland, Belgium in 19, May 1940, actually April, May of 1940. That left 532 trapped in Belgium, the Netherlands, and France. Now, what we know is this. Out of those 532, exactly 254 of them died in the Holocaust. Most of them died in the extermination camps of Auschwitz or Sobibor. Um, so just shy of 50% of the passengers who were returned to Europe perished in the Holocaust. Sometimes these accounts say, and the ship returned and everybody died in the Holocaust. Uh, that's an overstatement, um, not, not the case. But tragically, 254 lives did perish in the gas chambers of Auschwitz and Sobibor. Official apologies from the American government and the Canadian government arrive. The US issued an apology in 2012. Canada got around to it four years ago in 2018, decades and decades after the ship was turned away. The governments of these two nations, the United States and Canada, finally issued an official apology for their neglect of taking these, these refugees in. As for Captain Schroeder, he finally, remember, he didn't take the ship back to Hamburg. Okay? Uh, he landed it in June of 1939 in Antwerp. And it sat there. And of course, in September of 1939, and September 1, the Germans invaded Poland from the west. And a couple of weeks later, the Soviets invaded Poland from the east. Uh, war was underway. Okay? And uh, it wasn't until New Year's Day, 1940, that Schroeder returned the ship to Hamburg. However, Schroeder was basically stripped of rank. Well, he didn't have a rank. He was a, cap he was a captain. He was given a desk job, and he never sailed again. And captain Schroeder died at the age of uh, 73 in 1959. And a number of years after that, uh, March 11th, 1993, Yad Vashem recognized Captain Gustav Schroeder, posthumously, of course, as righteous among the nations. Righteous among the nations, meaning those who took Jews and gave them refuge and saved their lives or tried to save their lives. Okay? And that's very much what Schroeder did. Um, his actions were, were commendable. And here we see, this is an interesting picture. Uh, obviously these folks are a little bit advanced in age. Well, that's because they were children on the St. Louis. And here they are at the wall in Yad Vashem and pointing to the name Gustav Schrader. Uh, that was the captain that they remembered. So, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Barnes, for an absolutely wonderful presentation. Um, while I wait for some questions and comments to come in the chat box, I do have a question of my own. Sure. So, this. Uh, Manuel Benitez, who gave the passengers fake landing visas, because it was not the passengers' fault and they were ripped off with so much money, how come the Cuban government didn't honor the landing visas, even though they weren't technically real? I'm, I'm confused why the government wouldn't at least honor them considering the situation and the fact that these people didn't know any better, it wasn't their fault. First of all, Bruce, it wasn't only Benitez that was corrupt in, in the uh, Brew presidency. 
that there were other political office holders in Cuba. In fact, <clears throat> one is inclined to say that much of the operation of the Cuban government was itself inherently corrupt. And um, so Imbru was not exactly a, a commendable person at all. He was not, he was simply not going to honor that uh, or to, to make any uh, amends for it. Uh, but many of the same traits that um, I said described the uh, American scene isolationism, xenophobia, uh, anti-Semitism especially. Uh, those were not just American uh, traits. Those, those were found throughout the hemisphere. And the Cubans were not immune to that either. Uh, there was a fair amount of anti-Semitism in, uh, in Cuba. One thing that, that didn't happen, and I've often wondered, and I have never really found a satisfactory answer for this, is why didn't Schroeder take the, uh, the St. Louis to Mexico? Uh, we know uh, in a couple of later voyages, ships were allowed in, in Mexico. They took Jewish refugees. Uh, and I'm, uh, I, but I've never understood, uh, and I've never seen a satisfactory explanation as to why Schroeder didn't uh, try that option to take the ship to, uh, to Mexico. Uh, maybe, you know, he thought that if he took it to Miami, got so close that the government would have, would take heart and would accept these 900 plus passengers, um, that the American government wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna do that. It truly was the voyage of the damned. Yeah, thank you. Um, so for those of you who are at the Westfall branch, if you do have any questions, please let Morgan know. Our library staff members, she'll be happy to share in the chat. Um, we do have a question coming in. Dr. Barnes, did Captain Schroeder or his family face any retribution in the years after the voyage? No. Um, they were persona non grata especially the captain, his family may be a little less so, um, but he was not, he, he was not confined to a concentration camp. He was not locked up in a jail. Um, he, he wasn't um, given a death sentence or anything like that. He was a German citizen. And so the German government just simply removed him from being the captain of, of a ship. Uh, gave him a desk job and said, that's it. So basically the only reason he was even given a desk job is simply because he failed to follow orders and he used the ship yeah. as, a, as a haven for Jewish refugees instead of, its, it, instead of its intended purpose? Exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, Morgan, did you have any questions from our Westfall patrons? Um, I do have one question, and I think you covered this at the end, Roger, but can you just uh, verify it? So have uh, uh, folks here wondering, um, did the Cubans ever apologize? I know you said that the U.S. did, but did Cuba ever apologize? I'm going to take it. I don't think they did. Um, but I'm not 100% sure of that. We ought to, I ought to look that up and find out. I don't think so. Do you have any final questions from our patrons at Westfall, Morgan? I'm not getting anything else in the chat yeah. right now. Um, working on it right now. Give me just a sec, Brooke. I, <clears throat> I've yep, a so a question here is why, you know, you said that Canada apologized along with the US. Um, you know, the ship never went to Canada. Uh, Roger, do you have any sense as to why um, Canada apologized? Yeah, because the uh, many, many telegrams uh, went to the uh, Canadian government, uh, to the prime minister, uh, asking for safety, for refuge. on these requests. So yeah, Canada's 
Canada doesn't um, draw a lot of attention in the experience of the St. Louis, but uh, it too uh, could have and didn't uh, take these refugees. And, you know, I, I think, and, and I, I would wonder if our audience has some thoughts on this, but as there's a, a, an awful lot of concern about immigrants from the South in the United States today, I don't mean Southern United States, I mean uh, South of the Rio Grande, coming into um, Texas and, and other states. And there's some hostility and there's some resentment and there's some opposition. And those who wanna build a wall to keep these folks out. You know, I wonder if there's a lesson to be learned from St. Louis. Uh, and, you know, I, when I would talk about the St. Louis, when I was teaching the Holocaust class at Incarnate Word, my students were aghast. They go, why didn't we take these people? You know, there was only 900 of them. I mean, it, it, and look at all the kids that were on that ship, they'd say. You know, that, my students almost to a person were just appalled at the lack of humanity and compassion. Um, and I, I sometimes, well, I know not sometimes, I often wonder if today the, the kind of resentment um, that we have towards Central American immigrants, uh, Mexican immigrants, uh, the hostility, the resentment, all of that. I wonder if there's going to be a time, you know, much as with the St. Louis, uh, that we're going to look back at this and shake our heads and go, uh, you know, uh, what an embarrassment when it comes to fundamental dignity, fundamental compassion, uh, a concern about your fellow person, uh, his and her safety, uh, just a basic question of social justice. And uh, I got a feeling the answer is going to be, yeah. On down the road, we will look back at the events and the politics that we're experiencing in right now and uh, shake our heads the same way we shake our heads at looking back at this voyage of the St. Louis. So it looks like we have one final question in the chat right now. And I know you mentioned that Canada eventually apologized, but for when it came to the St. Louis, was Canada really even an option for them? Or did, I mean, yeah. and if it was, why didn't Captain Schroeder try and go sail past their ports as well? Go all the way up to, go up the East Coast and all the way into into Canada? I don't know. It might be that the, the, the way the Canadian government said no, the way the American government said no, uh, he felt cornered maybe, that there was no other option but to return it to Europe. Um, I mean, the, the entries were put to the Canadian government, but uh, Ottawa rejected those. And, um, just like Washington rejected the entry entrees that were made to it uh, by these passengers. Um, it was just, you know, the, the anti-Semitism, the xenophobia, those factors, the nativism, um, that, that was happening, not, as I said, not just in Cuba, not just in the United States, but Canada, Canada as well. And, uh, they just were not going to let these Jewish refugees in. We said no. You know, that's not all. Um, there was a bill that was uh, introduced in the United in the in the Congress of the United States. It was co-sponsored by a uh, congressman, congresswoman uh, from Massachusetts, and a, a senator from uh, male senator from New York State, and. Uh, that was a bill that would have changed uh, visa requirements and would have allowed 20,000 uh, Jewish children from Europe uh, to be allowed into the United States in excess of immigration quotas. Uh, that never got any tra traction 
in the United States Congress. Uh, it never was, it was considered, but it was never passed. So, you know, this is, this is one incident in a series of things really, where both in the United States, Canada, Cuba, uh, the fate of the St. Louis was damned. That's, that's that. But the fate of Jewish refugees more broadly than that was was damned as well in a variety of ways. I mean, we could have let 20,000 Jewish children immigrate from Europe and come to the United States, but the Congress wouldn't pass legislation allowing it. There you have it. We've had another question come in from the chat. And then I believe Morgan will have a question from our Westfall patrons after that. So our chat question is, while they were trying to find places for the people to go, did the ship have to worry about food running out, fuel? I mean, how did they handle those basic necessities? They, they were okay. Um, they were able to bring food on in Havana. They, were, uh, they had fuel. Um, so those, those things were okay. Um, they weren't going to run out. They were well. They were well stocked, and they were able to get refueled. Um, so they they were all right. <laughs> they they just wanted off. They wanted to get off the damn ship, and uh, every time they 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 attempted, uh, they were told no. Our immigration laws you're not in compliance with. So go away. Morgan, did you have a question from someone at Westfall? Yeah, yeah, so I have a question here. Um, Roger, do you know if, okay, so these landing uh, permits or whatever you called them that were essentially fraudulent, like they weren't, you know, um, documents that would actually allow the folks on the St. Louis to uh, get into Cuba. Do you know if like the Nazis were like, if there was a connection there, right? Like it almost seems, um, I don't know, too coincidental that, you know, the ship gets to Cuba and these documents that they have are, are basically no good. Um, so do you know if the Nazis or, or the other, um, I guess mostly the Nazis, um, if, if that party was involved at all with that sort of- um, no, no, the, the this was this was really pretty much outside um, the uh, confine. This was pretty much outside the German government. Um, I mean, you, you know, they they were maniacal enough that you, you would, uh, of course, think that they they could have been involved in this. But this was pretty much uh, Benitez himself looking at uh, vulnerable crew, people with money. Uh, who were anxious to uh, to get out of Germany, and he saw an opportunity to, to profit enormously by selling these bogus landing permits. Uh, it, it was pretty much his own hatched scheme to get rich quick. Instead, it got him canned from government, um, and he didn't get rich quick. But beyond that, uh, I don't. I don't think that the Nazi government had any hand in, in in that particular aspect of it. Well, thank you, Dr. Barnes. I don't believe we have any more questions. Am I correct, Morgan? Yep. Anybody else have any other questions? Nope. Nope. No. No other questions here, Brooke. Thank you. Okay. Great. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording before we close out today's program.